Okay, I'm Jim Beatty. I was going to talk to you about my vapor blaster. Um, I built a couple of motorcycles, little Hondas. They're really embarrassing because the cases are all ratty looking. And I clean them as well as I can in my parts cleaner. And they still don't look like anything. Uh, everybody else's look beautiful. So I talk and I find out there's a thing called vapor blasting. Uh, also called vapor honing or wet blasting. And people go to Ox Motors, they do it here in the city, but that's 45 minutes drive for me and a whole bunch of money. And they also make you clean the parts very clean before you get them vapor blasted. You can send them to Vancouver and get them done. Uh, ends up it's going to cost about $200 to get a set of engine cases done. I'm building a little Honda Bentley and I don't want to spend that much in total on it. So uh, I decided to build my own vapor blaster. Um, I didn't know anything at all about the process. I'd read about it. It's magic. Sandblasting is a dry process where they blast fairly aggressive crushed media. Could be glass, could be slag. And it takes off paint. It takes off the top surface of the metal. It takes off your serial number if you get your frame sandblasted. It's just a bad thing for delicate parts. Vapor blasting is the process of projecting glass beads, uh, somewhere around five thousandths of an inch diameter glass beads against the aluminum, usually you're blasting aluminum parts, sometimes you're blasting pot metal carburetors. What it does when it impacts the metal, it peens it. You end up with a piece that's shiny, looks like the original casting. It's a, it's a glorious process, I read. I also saw other people's crankcases that had it done, and yep, it's a glorious process. So I said I have to do this, and uh, I went online, YouTubed, uh, right up to there, and still didn't understand because they don't tell you the secrets. They want you to buy their vapor blasters. Vapor blasters are fairly expensive. So I found a guy called Josh Hubbard in New Zealand who publishes an e-book, and the e-book is called Vapor blasting in the home shop. So I spent the big bucks, 26 of the big bucks, and bought vapor blasting in the home shop. And he explained it and showed you how to do it. And talked about building it from scratch, building it out of uh, sandblasters being modified. There are various kinds of it. One of the kinds he described was to build it out of a dishwasher, which makes a lot of sense because the dishwasher is waterproof. This process is wet. There's water everywhere dishwasher, it stays inside. So I followed Josh Hubbard's instructions and I built this uh, vapor blaster. The heart of a vapor blast is a slurry of the glass beads with water. They have to be kept in suspension. You can't just uh, hit it with beads, hit it with water, whatever. So the main component is a pump that will mix the sand up with the water. So here I have my pail of water. Mine is an open loop system. I blast in here the water and sand, which is called a slurry, falls through to the bottom. In the bottom I have a pail. It collects in the pail. I have a pump in the pail. The main purpose of the pump is to stir up the water in the glass beads. So it recirculates the water. Does that by just pumping it up and right back down into the pail makes a big mess down there. I want a little bit to go up to my spray gun and so I open this valve and some goes up and I am able to direct that at the part. Meanwhile it continues to recirculate here and keep the slurry mixed. The slurry is about 10% glass beads, 90% water. I just do it by measuring the height of the water and the height of the glass beads in my pail. Um, <laughs> I found out why uh, Ox Motors wants you to clean your parts very, very clean because they don't want to change their water and clean the beads. The beads do get dirty because I've been known to uh, take parts straight after I've disassembled the thing and blast them and it takes off the grease and makes it just as beautiful as if I'd spend an hour cleaning it in the solvent. But my solvent, uh, my water becomes very dirty as a result. Anyway, I had the pail out because I was cleaning my water and glass beads.
and it also gives me a chance to show you how I put it together. Basically, I built a frame, I took off everything which is not dishwasher and left it in a pile. The other stuff is a cabinet, some form of a window to see through the cabinet, some gloves, and I found that back ones sell nice long gloves and they don't have to be heavy duty like sandblasting gloves. There's, uh, you can blast directly on these fairly light nitrile gloves uh, without putting a hole in them. They're really long. I have a fan because once you start spraying water and slurry, there's a bit of mist. There's a lot of mist in the cabinet. The mist sort of goes down through the hole because I blow air in through the top. Try and keep it clear for me to see what I'm doing. So the fan's blowing, it's not sucking. The fan's blowing. It's pretty elaborate. It's just like Dr. Dean, the side of the fan. Always blows it down, comes in the bottom. And it gets inside, goes up, and then I got holes across the front just to direct the air this way. But essentially, it's just to clear the mist out of there. The light is a waterproof LED. And I didn't have to worry, like the surface of the uh, glass is not getting eroded. So I have a sandblaster and I have the light inside a cheese whiz bottle. And I have to keep changing my cheese whiz bottle because it gets blasted up and doesn't let very much light out. This has been in here all the time. It was nine bucks at Uncle Wiener's and heck of a deal. It is 120 volts, so obviously you're messing with water, anything that's 120 volt. And water don't mix very well, so you want to keep it as safe as you can. I think it's safe, I haven't died yet. Uh, the air, I'm using my compressor in the corner of the shop. I inject it at about 100 PSI. I've got a very elaborate ball valve here. The ball valve sends the air up, goes in. The slurry is going up through this 5 8 inch heater hose. And the two of them mix at my very elaborate nozzle. And this is the uh, biggest secret. They tell you you have to buy the nozzle. It's made out of a Y fitting and it has angles. There's pressure on the slurry all the time. The pump's pumping. So it doesn't have to come in at a fancy angle. It just has to come in and meet with the air. What's important is the uh, size of the air nozzle. I just made that on the lathe. It's um, got a quarter inch hole down through a half inch rod. At the end I've got a one eighth inch hole and I've got sort of a tapered jet shape to it. When I have that inserted here, it's also in a uh, compression fitting. That's the ferrule in the compression fitting. I set it so this is back by about five millimeters from the uh, nozzle. The nozzle is a ceramic nozzle from the sandblaster. That five millimeters lets the air stream pick up the slurry and inject it out. And it's important, which is why the ferrule is really nice because I, I adjusted it when I was putting it together until I got a really nice spray. So, but conventional compression fitting there. And on this end, I just use one of my sandblaster nozzles, a ceramic nozzle. Then I found out 10 bucks gets you bags on eBay, so I bought a whole bunch of spares, but so far I haven't worn out the original. They work faster on the sandblaster than they do on the vapor blaster. I had to machine the, uh, again, this is just a compression fitting. Uh, important thing, the nozzle with the air has to be centered in the opening here, because that centers on the little concave cone in the back of the nozzle and the venturi between them is what sucks the slurry up. And I had to machine the nut a bit so that, that fit through fairly well and the body just sort of socketed in. Close together, it's easy to replace. The back one, it's become seized with time so I don't have to worry about adjusting. At first it would slip and I had to set it every time so I got a little scratch on it. Tells me how far back it is. <coughs> and once you tighten it 
taking those guys up. That's it. There's a bit of a tooth on the inside there to hold the air hose. The other end blew on, off once, and I don't know why, but I clamped it so it doesn't blow off anymore. Um, it gets noisy once the uh, fan is running, so I won't turn the fan on until I'm actually blasting something. The window is just plexiglass. I uh, siliconed it all around here. Silicone doesn't stand up forever, so I've had to touch it up. The other thing about this is it uh, tends to get um, the water, it fogs it up basically, so I've got a rain -X. Well, that stuff works great. Yeah. Yeah. And it just helps the water bead off there while you're blasting. The um, pump just sits down in the pail. And put it in out here because it's a little design problem. I can't fit it under there when the pail's in place. So this is going first. The pump is put up. This is a Princess Auto pump. It came on clearance sale, $46. It's a one-third horsepower effluent pump, uh, 2,800 gallons per hour, plastic impeller. I have to check and see how the impeller is doing, but so far it doesn't seem to be wearing out. Um, but you have to put risers on it because I've got sand, or glass bead, I mean, glass bead up for about an inch and a half on the bottom of the, like 10% of the pail of his glass bead. You don't want the glass bead on the impeller when it shuts off because it sets up like a sandbank in a river and the impeller won't turn and it won't start and you burn up your pump. So the little risers are to keep it above the resting level of the glass bead. And wiggle it in there. It wiggles itself in once it's running because the slurry gets all fluid. You can actually see it semi-translucent, these pail, this pail. <laughs> an extra six inches because they wanted just a bit of freeboard above the pump. You want the water to cover the pump, which is just barely, but it was going to splash around, so I just siliconed on another piece of pail to make it high enough. A little groove in the bottom locates the thing when I struggle to get it in there. Fits in the little groove. electricity and water well for some reason I have to plug under there. Now I hope you've got a ground fault uh, connector. Uh, no actually. No? <laughs> One of the good things about dishwashers also is that they have a sort of a concave bottom so the stuff maybe dish off dish dirt and water runs down and gets collected by the pump. Um, I couldn't use the dishwasher pump because this was a Bosch dishwasher and it had a electronically commutated motor had a variable speed motor if it had an ordinary 120 volt motor i might have tried running it with the dishwasher motor instead of buying a separate pump uh, in the book mr hubbard talks, talks about using components from the dishwasher to build your uh, slurry pump but anyway because i didn't use the dishwasher pump i just cut the bottom of the dishwasher and made myself a very fancy hose. What was that for a hose? All I'm doing is directing the water slurry and the air from my blower back into the pail. So I just hang that thing in the pail, return. Now you want the water to, uh, the slurry to get up to the nozzle, so a swivel fitting allows me to pull the pump out when I'm doing things like this and put it back together without major pipe fitting. And one size fits all. Okay. Now, it hasn't run for a while, so it's probably, it has to pick up its prime. It won't start immediately. You may have to add it to several minutes out while it picks up the prime and starts Okay. <coughs> what I do, I open up the valve for the recirculation. I let it recirculate in the pail until it's flowing well, and then I'll open up the one to send it up here. And uh, 
I'm going to do it without running the blower because the blower is noisy. I don't want to hear the pump working. I have a switch on the pump. I don't have a switch on the blower. I actually have to unplug the blower, which I've done just now for noise. So you can see, oh, actually, I'll let it settle and take a picture of that. Settle. It settles fairly fast. It's surprising. Um, I tried two different sizes of glass beads. Um, glass beads are numbered systems. So I started with number 10, and they are anywhere from 3 to 5 thou uh, diameter, and it just didn't quite clean things well enough for me. So I went to a number 8, and 8 is 5 to 8 thousandths of an inch in the glass beads. You don't want to wear out the glass beads because if they start breaking, they turn into an abrasive and they produce a dull finish instead of a nice shine. Um, I have a microscope and I actually check the beads to make sure most of them are still not fractured. Uh, I did that while I was cleaning it. It's kind of neat. I took a picture of it. That's the uh, five to eight thou glass beads. I only found a couple broken ones in the samples I was looking in, so I decided I don't need to replace my media yet. And I've been using it since Christmas. How much do the beads cost? Uh, 20 pounds is about $60. Okay. And the only place I could find them was Ackland's Granger. Um, and uh, in fact, the gloves for Ackland Granger also, they're becoming my favorite. Okay on that? Uh, that's the number eight that we're in there now. And that's what I've got left, and I've filled it probably one and a half times. So I expect there's probably ten refills. In okay. The, bag. Uh, the only reason I filled it one and a half is because you lose some when you start washing the beads. Uh, you put a garden hose in there and let it flow, and just let it overflow the crap out of the pail. Oh, okay, so to wash the beads, you basically have a screen or something on top. No, we just let the water flow. Just the beads settle. The you beads settle, okay. The game here. Right now you can see they've settled. Yeah. Uh, so if you put it in a low enough flow and just stir them up once in a while, you can get them clean. You'll lose a bit, which is why I've filled them about one and a half times. Okay, so I'll start them again. Get my pump going. And right away, you can see it mix up. So that's a slurry now. It's no longer separate water and glass beads. It's a mixture. You run about 10% glass bead, and uh, one way to test that is to actually spray it through the nozzle into a cup, let it settle, and you see the one tenth of a glass bead. You're right on. But that was a mystery that the YouTube things didn't answer. Okay, I'm just opening up the valve to send it to my nozzle. So at this point, I've got slurry spraying over the nozzle. But there's not enough force in that to do any blasting, so that's when you connect the air. And put 100 psi acceleration behind those little glass beads, and then they start cleaning things. Very elaborate mechanism that. Um, I'm going to keep this okay. because because they're glass beads, they get everywhere. So when you're blasting something, especially carver, you don't want glass beads everywhere. So the fancy $4,000 vapor blasters have a rinse function. I have a tail. <laughs> so I rinse with my tail and I blast with my nozzle. <clears throat> the neat thing is that the, sand, the glass beads that come out are in there for when I refill. Oh, I've saved the glass. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was going to get a cup. I have a cup. Yeah. This is Josh's recommended method for making sure you have enough bead in your slurry. Fill a container. Just let it settle in the container. And if you're settled at about a tenth of your total volume, your slurry's about the right strength. That's interesting. So you don't have to apply any error when you're doing the test. 
No, you just actually don't want to. Yeah. It'd be a real mess. The spray without the air, like you see the inside of the cabinet's all dirty. Mm -hmm. It's always dirty. B. That's my name. Anyway. <laughs> so it's full of glass beads all the time. And the glass, when you're looking through, gets beady. And you can't see through it. So you can spray it with a nozzle if you don't use the air. It doesn't damage the plexiglass. It just washes off the, the glass beads. You can see that. Right there. I'll paint something. Okay, that's... I think it was a 350 Honda. I don't know what. It's got no guts, it's a shell. There's no diagram or slide or anything in it. So don't yell at me for not disassembling. Well, you of course should disassemble, but you can see the general scuzz of it. Why don't you put it there? Turn on the fan because I like to be able to see what I'm doing. The elaborate mechanism there. That's not that loud. No, it's not terrible. And you can do it for short sleeves. You don't have to wear a respirator. I like them a lot better than dry blasting. Okay. Uh, so, that's it. The blast. Some of it dirty for comparison. Put it off my window. You see, uh, it's not all that warm in here. I got it on here. I should have done There's some writing there. It does not upset the writing. You know the stampings and stuff on the carburetor? just stay perfect. It doesn't take the edges off. It, it's shot team. It's not actually eroding it the way sandblasting is. It's clean. I've heard tell if you do it on a porous surface, you know, like those British paint cases. It closes up the aluminum to some extent mm -hmm. and actually reduces the uh, porosity. Anyway, I actually uh, figured a vapor blaster fixed my Honda for me this winter. I uh, took the carburetors off to clean them up because they were scuzzy and I have a vapor blaster now. And I found a hole in one of my rubber boots. Which is why it ran so crappy last year. I've had to go in four years, it. 60 miles an hour. Wow. Wouldn't pull fifth gear. Wouldn't cycle. <laughs> but it, it runs great now. New boots. Anyway, the paper blaster saved me. There's the uh, there's the uh, results on the Benley motor cases, which. I'm going to leave like that. I may paint side covers because I think they were painted originally. But uh, the they turned out amazing. Yeah, and this wow. was submerged. This was a this engine was in a flood. It was uh, the whole bike was flooded. It took me uh, three months of penetrating oil and diesel fuel to not get the pistons free. So I finally uh, took the camshaft out and made up adapters for the spark plugs and freed the pistons with the grease gun. But anyway. Um, yeah, I've been vapor blasting as I go, and it's really a neat way to clean things very clean that I never thought would be clean. That was totally corroded, you know, that white corrosion that you get with aluminum, and it's been sitting in water for a long time. It was, uh, I can't see. And the outside was not bad, the outside was probably coated with lacquer the way the cases are. 
but the inside was totally corroded and it cleaned right up with the vapor blasting.